All right. Why, why do people need feel the need to add criteria to my criteria? This is my criteria, bro. Feel the need to add criteria to my criteria, bro. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's rank all of the players at Worlds from major regions. Um, I don't want to do all the way to 70. I think it just gets muddy even after 25. It gets giga muddy. I think it's like uh, very difficult to to compare cross roles and whatever. I just think it's like it just becomes a conversation piece and... Uh, I am not super, super intrigued. But my criteria, right? My criteria is lane phase. It's like how good you lane. Uh, I think this is very, very self-explanatory. Team fighting as well. Very self-explanatory. Role agency. So basically, uh, in my mind right now, in terms of role agency, I think the most important role is mid lane. It, it, it almost always is, right? Uh, mid lane. And then I think that I think I'm, I'm split between mid and support and jungle, but I'm going to put support because... A, a, a super in a lot of cases is just a, a, a just just a champion in your team that doesn't need to clear camps. So in terms of their agency, in terms of setting up the map, in terms of their champions that they are playing currently, like in terms of the engagements that you can do, in terms of the space that you can take, in terms of, uh, of course, um, you know. Uh, the map impact you have support is a role that has insane amount of agency and i think it's very clear when a great support plays against a weaker uh, a support or non-great support i think that's where you see the biggest underlying differences i think that you can point to the big change up that flyquist did in terms of their improvement for busio against team liquid that changed up how much they can do in that series i think the lights performance definitely uh he outperformed Lehens extremely hard, in my opinion. I think that you can say the same for Europe in terms of Mickey. He embarrassed all the other supports. And I think it showed very clearly in terms of how they find information, in, in terms of how they utilize tempo, in terms of how they see and view value over, of course, everybody else in the game, right? Uh, uh, so I think support is the second strongest role at the World Championship, which is uh, a unique position to be in. Uh, next one in is jungle. I think that jungle as a role is very dynamic and uh, is, uh, you know, a lot of the arguments I can say for support is also for jungle. Uh, Midland is a central role where we see most of the action. So it's something that is getting played around. Uh, I think that uh, in the end you have, um, you know, a lot of, um, you know, just action around mid lane you get your mid lane ahead they're stronger on side and then of course that translates to a lot more and next one in line is top lane i think top laners you know being strong for grub timers being strong on side and having these champions that can definitely like carry gains like a Jax can be dangerous kesante can be dangerous uh, i think that there's a lot of champions when they reach their item spikes can be super super impactful but of course their agency is uh, limited in comparison to the other roles and then finally ad carries ad carries right now have turned into a role where you basically play champions that are very good low economy champions that can survive a lot of uh, a lot of of course you know all-ins whether it's Ezreal you have Ziggs being picked something that is just long range can clear mid waves can lane well so you have Jin, Ash uh, you have Jin, Ash Misfortune still being played Ziggs you have Kalista coming back if Kalista's coming back Draven's coming back uh, a lot of there's teams already that played Kalista before but now Kalista is definitely more on the radar uh, so there is just a question of the AD carry is often picked to just make the other roles better you know it's like you want to have push both because it gives your support a lot of options in the game and then your jungle a lot of options in the game so that is what you are centralizing your ad carry pick uh, there was a little period where the ad carry meta was zeri kaisa ezreal and then it looked a little bit different and then you had these aiming super carry games and uh the the, the meta was uh, across the board just a, a very different experience uh but this is my role agency priority so you're going to see like mid laners and supports uh, dominate a little bit higher uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that the jungle players are worse than the super players or the top lane players are blah 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 uh, there's going to be some outliers of course whether it's like viper or bin or whatever 
But I just wanted to highlight, you know, that this is going to be a part of my reasoning. Uh, when there is a big gap between a player and the next player in line, I do think and consider that too, right, in terms of my placements. Uh, but I, I, I highlight again that in terms of placing players, I think there is always like maneuverability between like one to three points, maybe besides top five. I think that is like the, the one, uh, you know, the main thing that is, uh, you know, key. Um, as I'm doing this, uh, I will ignore questions that derail completely. It's like, what do you think about this player when I'm talking about a completely different player? Uh, I will get to everything and then at the end we can cover uh, questions and thoughts uh, from, of course, the panel, the audience, the, the, the brilliant audience, the genius audience. And my bias, there's going to be things that I care about a lot more than maybe other people don't care about. Like I care about map movements and support tempo play. I, I value that insanely high. Uh, so you're going to see that in, in, in my, my, my list too. Uh, I think that um, when it comes to macro, I also think this is insanely important. And that is something that ties into what my bias is. I think that there's going to be cases where I value legacy and, and clutch factor very heavily. And in some cases, less so because you know it depends on what my opinion the meta is going to be right I, I do think it's going to be central around mid lane i do think that we're going to have carry mid lane is being picked i doubt that um you know the the, the heavy roams style will ever come back I, I i don't think so but of course i could be wrong i could be wrong uh, so i'm not saying i'm not saying 100 that's gonna happen nevertheless I think the best thing for us to do is to go roll for roll and then uh, continue um, uh, with the list after that. I think uh, the most easy one to start with, in my opinion, is mid lane. Right? Uh, so we're going to start with putting Chovy at the top. Uh, I think the Chovy uh, definitely, you could argue that Zeka had, you know, a better playoffs than Chovy. I think saying that is not completely crazy, but I don't want to discount the incredible year that Chovy has had as a player. I think in terms of raw skill and talent, I think that Chovy as a player, I think that, you know, nobody comes uh, like close in terms of how much of a player he is in the 1v1. I think the main criticism you can have towards Chovy and what could be a concern if I'm going, if I'm arguing against myself, I think Chovy as a player, I think the one international trophy that he's won is the MSI, winning SK is giga impressive too. I don't want to be that guy. Like, like he, he, like the choke narratives is a big fucking meme. The main thing that Chovy does, and something that he has carried over from his Griffin days, is that he can be very stubborn about the champions that he plays. Last year at Worlds, didn't want to play Oriana, stuck to Akali, you know? Going even and having like a head of CS on Akali was a win, but that wasn't big enough of a win in terms of what kind of a player he needs to be to actually win games. And I think that's a main criticism towards Chovy as well in the Hammer Life series. If you think about the central players that need to be clutch and stand out, I think that uh, Chovy and Canyon are the two players that need to be able to break through the patterns and the trend, trends of best of fives in order to actually push Genji to a championship victory. At MSI, they busted out the Nidalee, they busted out Yon, and uh, there were a lot of things that aligned to Chovy's biggest strength, right? Uh, there was, of course, the conversation uh, with, uh, you know, the Aurelion Soul. Like, there was only, like, what, three players that could play Aurelion Soul at MSI? None of the Eastern players played Aurelion Soul. Cream, Knight, Baker, all ran it down, right? All completely ran it down. Um, there was the Koki, how many packages did people fly in with, right? I think that Chovy definitely, you know, um, was in his element at MSI and he was willing to push it beyond that when people were banning him out. But then you have the series against How Alive where you kind of want them to be the one to pick Yon away and maybe invite Yon against Akali, against Zeka, or and make it dynamic, you know, be the player that steps up to the play. And I think this is what I want to see more of. If Chovy is going to win the championship, we need to see that side of him as he has shown, uh, you know, at MSI. I think there is definitely moments where stubbornness has paid off for him. 
like back to back Azir games, right? Uh, where he carried against Han Life in a series where his teammates was letting him down. But I think that's the key thing. I think Chovy and Canyon need to have, of course, agency in the game to carry. And I think that's the main criticism you can say towards Chovy. Right? But Chovy for me is the number one mid laner. Uh, I think the follow up is Knight. I think Knight is a player that is severely underrated by, I think, the community that doesn't watch LPO. I think that uh, Knight has a very, very wide spread of champions that he plays. I think there are metas where he's better than Chovy uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, playing the Annies, the Lissandras, the Nikos, the Vexes. I think even Ari, even though Chovy has had great success on Ari. Uh, I think that there are circumstances where Knight is a more effective player than Chovy. And I think that um, we have, you know, I think we've seen enough from Knight, um, especially now in the playoffs, that he stands tall and above uh, everybody else uh, in, of course, the LPL region. I think that Billy Billy was, uh, you know, you, you, you can argue, you know, that some of the champion choices that Knight did in the last best of five to play against Gen.G uh, can be argued against. But I think that Knight in LPL in summer has definitely shown like a very widespread of, um, you know, like a widespread of champions, like a fucking Smurgos boot of, 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 of different champions that he can play. So this is a very talented player. I think that Knight is, is fantastic, very good for the team. And I think that, um, you know, it's it's weird because for some reason Knight and Chovy, you know, they are they are people talk about them as if they are chokers, which is such a big meme. You know, they, they have one like the, the 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 achievements of Knight and Chovy, like the, the narrative that should be really, really pushed, in my opinion, is how how interesting and similar their careers are in terms of their achievements and how they represent the regions. Uh, Chovy lost his streak now, but Chovy and Knight were collecting regional titles and there's been moments where Knight was better than Chovy and there's been moments where Chovy is better, right? But I think this year Chovy has been very, very precise and very clean. And I think you can argue like his run, run in spring, I think as an individual <laughs> performance, it's up there in one of the best individual performances that I've ever seen. So, Knight for me is a clear, clear second. So, the next one in line here is Zeka. So, what does Zeka not bring to the table that Chovy and Knight has? I think a very important thing about mid lane is a, a certain level of experience and a certain level of spread in terms of being effective during different, different matters. Once again, I repeat, Zeka, you could argue that he played better than Chovy in the playoffs. And I think that would be a fair point to make in terms of his, you know, in terms of how they flex Smolder, in terms of how they, of course, played around the Yon. I think that he was a lot more in tune with where the meta needed him to be. But at the same time, I do think that the Light and Peanut just play better as a jungle support. And I think that's, of course, central in the game patterns that we see, saw emerge in the spring split. Zeka, I think that insanely talented. And I think that if you threw him into a zone where you, let's say you played on 14-15, uh, Zeka against Knight and Chovy, I wouldn't say that Zeka would be like the underdog against these guys at all. I think that on a 14-15 patch, I think how life looked very exciting. But that's the main thing, right? As things progress, as, as things get tested, a player like Zeka has executed insanely well during specific conditions. And there is a lot of props to be given in that. But you can see, for example, if we rate a player like Cream, I think there are circumstances where Cream is one of the best mid laners in the world. But, but, there's a lot of circumstances where he's not. And I think that's important, very important to, to highlight because being great over a long period of time is insanely impressive, right? Insanely impressive. So, I think that I've made my arguments clear for Zeka. I think the next one in line, maybe this one is surprising to people, but 
I do think that with the criteria that I care for when it comes to mid laners, I think that Caps belongs. I think that Caps as a player, the main thing when it comes to champions that make sense for Caps, right? I think that he has such a wide champion spread. Like when it comes to metas where he's effective and actually carries his team with the resources he's given, I think there is no metas where I am not super excited about caps. I am less excited about caps in metas where mid lane has less agency because his team relies on him so much. If the meta is Nautilus mid, I am less excited because I want caps to do more. That is the main thing for me when it comes to caps. I think when it comes to caps, I think that uh, especially like if you look at the Messiah, uh, his individual performance, he was outplaying people left and right. And I think that he had a very, very good performance. I think that when it comes to, um, you know, my expectations for him coming into this, it, like we, we just go back to the criteria, right? Uh, it's like, I think that his macro play in terms of he, how he side lanes, I think is one of the best in the world. No joke, one of the best in the world. And that is something super important for a solo laner. One of the best in the world. I think that his um, champion pool, fucking phenomenal. His regional resistance, not super impressive. Mid lane in Europe is kind of fucking oof, right? Mid lane in Europe is kind of oof. Like mid lane in Korea, now that's fucking rough, bro. That's fucking, that's hard in the paint, you know? It's like BDD didn't even qualify and he was fucking crazy good, right? I think in terms of his legacy and his clutch, in terms of how he has performed at past international tournaments, there's definitely been moments where he's been underwhelming. Uh, but I do think that he has a very, very good champion spread. I think that he has had just so much experience under his belt that I feel that I can really, really trust him coming into this. Okay? The next one where I think that you can argue to even put him above caps, because when I look at LNG as a team, I think the only reason this team has success is Scout and Zika. This team was the number one seed coming out of the Heaven group in the LPO. And I think the main thing for me, right, is I think that the, the main reason they were winning games was, was Scout and Zika, okay? Scout, when it comes to LNG, um, I think the main thing that makes me unenthusiastic about it, the Scout and not putting him above caps, uh, while I think Scout is insanely talented and uh, one of the best mid laners at the World Championship, uh, I think what it comes down to is I, I don't buy into how LNG play the game. Uh, I think that their approach to macro is very stiff and I think in the moments of the in-between, I think that in, in the in-between, meaning how they distribute farm and how they play with jungle, how they play with support, obviously these are things that maybe I shouldn't be blaming Scout for, uh, but these are things that come to mind. Uh, I think that the, the lack of resistance and the lack of like urgency in their gameplay, uh, I, I can't blame on only the weaker players. I think that Scout is insanely talented. I think he's really, really good. Uh, I think that in regards to the play-in period, I didn't think Scout was good. I think that in spring, Scout didn't look good at all, in my opinion. But I think as LNG was improving and them getting to the point where they basically qualified to the World Championship with winning one best of five against a very tight Weibo Gaming, um, I think the period that LNG was doing well was mostly due to Scout and Zika in my mind. So looking back at it, you know, I think that he had good Yon games, good Azir games, but I do think, you know, I think for people that don't watch LPL, the main thing that stands out right, was like Scouts World Championship um, last year was very poor. Um, I think that the year before as well, I think that's something that uh, taints his runs post, of course, his World Championship win. So I think, uh, you know, uh, that's something uh, to, to highlight, you know, but in, in terms of the legacy, I think that's something that, that, that hangs over his shoulders, you know. 
now now it gets interesting honestly now now it gets kind of interesting because now i think it's just dependent on taste right it's just dependent on taste so 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 what names do we have let's let's start there so in terms of the names that we have right it's like we have the showmakers and the jahus and the creams and the humanoids and the quads and the apas i think that all of these players definitely are flawed in their own way. And we're going to explore those flaws together as we talk about them. But I, but, but I think it's, it's, it's very clear to me that these are the five best mid laners at the tournament. I'm, so I think a big part of this conversation should also be where do you think that the meta will actually land, right? I think, I think that's a very important conversation too. Because if the expectation is that we're going to have a lot of Syndra gameplay, Talia gameplay, and Leblanc gameplay, then all of a sudden a player like Cream should be worse, right? And a player like Showmaker should be better. Uh, a player like um, Humanoid in an Oriana Syndra meta should do a lot better, right? Because he's known for his mages. And maybe a player like APA, who did very good on Koki on Tristana, and his zigs being targeted and not being wanting to play Yon. Uh, those are things that come up, right? So, sure, Yon is super, super good. And I think that Leblanc is something that Cream plays. I think that if, if Cream is in a position where, like, the meta develops in the direction of, like, uh, like in my mind, if you're preparing against top esports, you should always ban Yon. Because I think if you play Yon, he's going to drop Silas, Akali, uh, whatever, right? And he's going to be super, super happy. Or he gets Yon himself and he's going to be super, super happy. Right? And I think Yon is going to be a ban. I can see him play Leblanc. I think he was one of the best Leblancs in the world, honestly. But it was like the AD Leblanc version. Right? So I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here. Because I think past this point, it does get very iffy. These are some very, very flawed players. So I'm going to... to where do we start us off? I I do want to I, I do think that Cream had a bit of a fall off, but I do think that Cream had overall a very impressive year. I I think that the main thing, the main thing that you can hold against Cream, I think, is you know, he lacks experience. I think that in the series against uh, Genji, you know, in the Tristana uh, occurrences, I think that he looked fucking phenomenal. And I think that I appreciate the fact that this is a player that shows a very competitive peak uh, in comparison to everybody else, right? I think in terms of his lane phase and his team fighting, there's been many moments throughout the year where I was excited about Cream, and I think that he made Top Esports competitive. And I think there are arguments to be made against maybe for, for, for different players. And there is a world where Cream falls flat. And I admit that. But I think that uh, there's definitely like Tristana games where I was hoping that he would do more. I think that in the process of Topis was like underperforming when his bot lane was performing bad. I think that Cream slots in there too. But a lot of the arguments against Cream are arguments that could be made maybe against Zeka too, right? So I think that uh, for me, I put Cream here because I think he's shown very, very high peaks, you know? Who's next in line? You know, I think it needs to be so. So, so I think Legacy like plays a point, right? I, I put Legacy in clutch here, right? So it's like, even though I, I do think that it's hard for me to put any other Western player ahead of the likes of Baker, Jahu, and also Showmaker. It's, it's, it's very difficult uh, because I think that Humanoid as a player, I think that he is really, he has a, a really, really high ceiling. One, one of the best ceilings ever, right? But in the games where he needs to step up to the plate, I do feel like those are the moments where Fnatic look their weakest, right? I think that in a world where, like, like Fnatic and Mad Lions are very similar in the way that they kind of match to the enemy, right? In the way that they play. They kind of chase the kills in terms of their macro approach, strong early games. And then when the enemy decides to slow down, 
then they don't know what to do with themselves, right? The main difficulty with judging a player like Humanoid is what is the norm? What is the norm? Because he's had very, very high highs and he has had very, very low lows. He got soul killed as Quay against Aurelion Soul and then he, he he's completely popping off uh, some, some other game, right? And I, I, I think that's... I, I think it's very hard to put APA as well, you know? I think APA, you know, I think it's very hard to put the Western mid laners above the Eastern ones. So in my mind here, I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm throwing Showmaker kind of a bone here. I am throwing Showmaker a bone here, not because I, I do think the Jahu has performed better leading up to the tournament. I do think so. But I think in the in the reshaping and fucking the step back of the Tristan and the Koki, which seems to be the biggest poison for Showmaker, I do think that he can show a greater performance. So this is involving speculation about the legacy of Showmaker when it comes to Syndra, when it comes to LB, Talia, and the Vi combos. I think that's where one looked their best, right? Maybe Lucid playing the AD jungles. I think that opens up the field. But I can admit that I think that in terms of gameplay, probably if I look at just the body of work, I do think that Jahu has shown more. So as you can see, it's just a matter of taste here. Right? It's just a matter of taste. Showmaker had some atrocious games, but I do think in the regionals, I do think that he played better. It's just that it's important to highlight, you know, in, in this block of players here, they haven't had the most impressive, you know, run. I think in the games where Weibo looked very clean, uh, I do think that Jahu played well. But I, there was a point where I couldn't count on my hands the amount of times Jahu would just die on the mid-wave, right? And that to me is something that I can't take out of my mind. But in a lot of the Weibo wins, and there had to be plenty of them, I do think the Jahu had an impact. I think that when it comes to these three players, I think there were moments where they played the Tristana, the Corkies. You could make a montage of these three players doing absurdly gruesome mistakes. <laughs> gruesome, gruesome mistakes. And that's what makes it harder to judge. And then the main question here that I'm thinking as I'm comparing Jahu and Faker, because I, I'm pretty happy with Showmaker on 7 because I'm being generous because of the meta shifts that I'm expecting, is if the legacy of Faker is something that um, is going to make him, um, you know, number 8 for me over Jahu. Because now as I'm reflecting on it, like I, I am picturing all the times Jahu got caught on mid, but then there's like the Faker Malphite ultimates. And then it got to the point where Faker even on Azir was not performing well. And before you start to unravel, you know, all of the personal things that like, like I'm, I'm looking at gameplay only. I can sympathize with the person. I, sympath I say it all the time on stream, like I sympathize with Faker the person because heavy is the, the crown, you know, you know, the, the crown is very, very heavy. Faker needs to be doing fan meet after fan meet after press after press after commercial after scrim after, you know, he, he, the heavy is the fucking crown, you know, and uh, Faker, you know, 
has enough of a legacy that he can pop off completely, but I think it's important to rate him fairly based on his performance that, um, you know, you need, to, you need to be honest about his performance leading into the tournament that we can accurately celebrate if he actually, you know, plays out of his mind at this tournament. Again, right? I, I just think that it's very important for the story, to be honest, right? Yo, thank you very much, Tag One Joe. I appreciate that, and uh, I'm happy that you <laughs> managed to, to buy a house, bro. I'm, I'm proud of you, of course. And you're always welcome. You don't need to sell, but I appreciate the support, as always. 32 months is a shit long, shit amount of time, bro. So, I repeat, I think Vegas Legacy puts him up here, right? And uh, I, I just think that he lost teeth on even the faker picks, you know? It got to the point where you didn't even need to ban Azir, and he wasn't even effective on Azir, you know? If we look at faker's best performances, I do think that he was good during spring. I think that he was good during spring. I think that his World Championship, I think that you can easily argue that he was the best mid laner at the World Championship 2023. And I think that's, um, I think that's fucking great, you know? That's, uh, that's fair play. But I think this is a fair assessment based of, you know, his, his, his body of work in, in, in summer and leading up to, of course, you know, the playoffs and the regionals too. So there's that. And I, I, I can definitely, you know, it's, it's not a crazy thing to, to, to say that T1 is going to perform a lot better at the tournament. Like if you look at my breakdown of of, of the of the of the teams, I did say that T1 has a range from from one th one to ninth place, you know. And um, I think that once again, if someone told me Faker should be seventh, should be eighth, should be even sixth, I don't think it's a crazy thing to say, you know. I don't think it's a crazy thing to say at all. So there's that, you know. But I repeat. We, I think that his, his legacy is very powerful and you definitely have to highlight it. But I think placing him here based on his performance is still going to be accurate regardless of what he does at the tournament, you know? All right. And now uh, we are just filling in with uh, the, the Western players, right? The Western players. Now it's just a question of taste, right? I think all of this is just a question of taste. Do we even have the right numbers? 14, 4, 4, 3, 3, yeah. That's 14. We are missing Humanoid, we're missing APA, we're missing Quad, and Quid. Let's uh, work... Oh yeah, Frescawi. So I, I think I put Frescawi last. Um, I think I think Prescawi has a very unimportant role on the team. Um, I, I think that whenever I see Prescawi have success, like whether it's in lane phase, it's usually off of the back of something egregious that was given to him. And once again, I I, I highlight my bias. Right? It's like the, the moments I've seen Prescawi get ahead and. Um, and, and do well, it's, it's usually given to him. It's not something that he takes. I think that when it comes to Mad Lions, I do think that Frescawi is the biggest passenger on this team. I think that he's the biggest passenger. And the next one I would put here is uh, Quid. I think that Quid plays a very important role for his team. I think that I appreciate how he's willing to go outside the box to pick champions that are going to carry the game. Uh, I think that that's something that the Hunt of Thieves need. I think definitely that's something that the Hunt of Thieves need. 
but I don't think this is something that he's going to be able to do against um, any of the mid laners above him. So, let's quit. Next in line, I do think... This, this might be surprising, but I think... So, so, so let me let me present my read on Team Liquid. Quad is FlyQuest, so Hollow One. Please uh, <laughs> don't talk with such confidence when you are wrong. Um, we continue. Is there a, is a civil war in my chat? I think Team Liquid is a team that is just that their sum is. Um, Far greater than their parts. I think that um, APA as a player, I think that he found a lot of success playing the Tristana Koki. But I think that he fell in the same hole as Chovy did, right? Meaning that he stagnated and he didn't improve, right? Didn't get better, didn't, you know. Um, find the champions. This is the same way, same exact way as uh, our boy Zeka did against Chovy, right? He was the the Yon gaming, right? The Yon gaming was there. Yon was coming through. Uh, we had uh, we had the Smolder as well. Uh, I think that um, you know uh, this is something that for me APA lacked. And I think it's very important to highlight that APA is still very early on in his career. I think that I would like to see him have success over a greater span of metas before I am ready to rate him higher, you know? Before I'm ready to rate him higher. So, instinctually, I want to put APA here. And I think what it comes down to for me is, I know people are gonna say, your APA when he played against Humanoid, he took a big dump on him, he took a big shit on him, but I want to see APA succeed through this meta change. That is the main test for him. I am very wary of rating players with not super much experience. He has experience, EWC, MSI, Worlds, yes. But compare it to everybody else, okay? Besides maybe Cree, you know? Besides maybe Cree. Every motherfucker here has done it and gone back and, you know, told the tale. You know? There's some champions that APA definitely is good on. Talia is good, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see, like, is APA a young player? Can he play melees? Can he go branch off into that meta, right? What, what, where, can, where can APA expand as a player? We know his Aurelion Soul, we know his Ziggs, right? We know about his uh, Tristana, his Koki. I want to see development. And I know there's going to be a very fair criticism. I think that uh, pointing out that API has beat Humanoid twice is very fair. But I think Humanoid as a player, right? This being once again, you have to pick the side of the coin, right? Like where does where where what do you put the bigger focus on? Are you overwhelmingly thinking when you think of humanoid, do you think of his floor more or do you think about his ceiling more? And then it's just a question of flavors, right? It's just a question of flavors. We all know, right? We all know that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if Fnatic is going to do well, it is going to be at the back of Razork, Humanoid, and then maybe June. We all know that. They live and die. They live and die by that. And Humanoid at a ceiling does super well. But whenever they are playing teams that they're supposed to beat, they play like ass. And if that's your focus, I respect that. 
If, if that's your focus, I respect that take 100%. It's not a crazy thing to have as a take. Because not everything is black and white, right? But for me, humanoid is number 11. So here comes Quad, right? Here's Quad. Quad is very interesting to me. I think Quad is really, really good. The main thing that stands out for me with Quad is the fact that I think that he was very, very willing to swing with the punches when it came to the adaptations you did in your champion pool. I think that he played much better than APA in that final best of five that pushed him over the edge, which I think was crucial. I think this lane phase is really fucking strong. I think his team fighting idea is super good too. And I liked it a lot. And once again, this is one of those, you know, this is this is a player that has played for uh, for 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 a bit, right? He's played in LCK and so forth on, under a different name. But I think that uh, Quad is, is a very interesting player. I think that out of all these players, I think Humanoid has shown the highest ceiling, right? But his floor is, is kind of down there. Uh, and I think that I've made my arguments clear now for my mid lane list. I think that probably these, these are the hardest one to judge. I think this is also depending on taste. And I, I think the top five, I don't think that any changes can be made to top five. I think there needs to be a combination. These three need to be top three, and then four, five needs to be scout caps. I, I am very, very cemented on that. Needs to be. All right? I think these these guys uh, can you can swap caps five, scout four, depending on what you want to say, right? You can say caps played against bomb, mid lane, whatever, you know, like uh, whatever, right? Okay, so that's mid lane. That took a long fucking time. I thought mid lane would be easy, but that took a long, long time. We, we are in deep already. We talk about middling for one hour, right? Where do we go to next? I think ball lane. Let's do ball lane. Let's do ball lane. So this, this one is so interesting because you are measuring the legacy of players against the performance of players. If you look at spring and summer, uh, I mean, sorry, summer, and you compare LPL to LCK, you had two AD carries that um, were performing out of their fucking mind. And that is aiming and light. I think light probably had the best AD carry performance out of any player in the meta that is Misfortune, Ziggs, Jin, Ash, Ezreal. Aiming dominated during Zeri, Ezreal, Kaiser, right? That was his main point of domination. I think he still did well playing MF, and Ziggy, but obviously Dam one need a lot more out of their AD carry to be successful because obviously that is the guy. But then finally, there is Viper. Viper, I think that he had a very, very solid split. Players like Viper, they get talked about to the point where they get overrated, right? That's very easily. It's like people get, get blinded to, to even, let's say, the poor performances that Viper has. The same thing, the same thing can be said about our, um, um, you know, the same thing can be said about Ruler. The same thing can be said about Elk, right? Ruler, Elk. I think that these players that are very used to carrying games, they were not super comfortable. Uh, not super comfortable. Um, you know, playing this new role that AD Carry is. So as we evaluate, right, we take the recency into mind, we think about the ball lane meta. I think the ball lane meta is going to be the same, by the way. Ball lane meta is going to be the same. I think the ball lane meta is going to be the same. Uh, I think we're going to have Jin. I think Jinx is the most fake shit ever. Maybe I'm going to bite my tongue uh, when, when, when uh, but I think Jinx is completely fake. I think we're not going to have any carry bot laners. I think we're going to see Jin, Jin, Ziggy, MF, Ash, Varus, Kalista. We're going to have, we're going to have all that business, you know, which is good for players like Gumayushi, good for players like Light, good for players like Viper, right? I think that Jinx is complete ass. I think MF is still strong. Not OP, but still strong. Caitlyn could be played by somebody like Gumayushi, right? So, in my mind, in terms of just pedigree, right? Pedigree. 
players like Aiming and Lai, I think that they, they have had standout splits and they should be celebrated for it. I think that's fair and I think that's fine and I think that's perfectly good and important to highlight. But for me, the best AD carry coming into the World Champion still needs to be Viper. I think that he has enough great games under his belt that it's okay to say that this guy is absolutely completely bonkers and completely out of his mind in terms of how he plays. I think that there's definitely like games where he played worse than what you expect from him. But I think as playoffs ramped up, Viper was a sniper. I think that um, Viper is a fucking fantastic player. And I think that you don't want to bet against him just because Light had one of the best performances, you know, out of any AD in summer, you know? I think that the the, the legacy of, of Viper and what he is as a player, when you just see him move on the screen, you, you know, you, you, you can't push away from that. So, so Viper is there. And now, what is the continuation? I do think that, uh, you know, you know, if, if, if it wasn't for Summer Split, I think that in terms of raw talent and raw skill, like watching all of these players that are always showing up to these tournaments, I would put Elk here, right? But Elk was very quiet, very quiet. He was dying on side, dying on mid wave. It didn't seem like he wanted to play MF. It didn't seem like he wanted to play Ziggs. Uh, like I, 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 I like if it, if it's just raw skill, I think that Elk is the easy slot in, right? I think that's the arguments you can you can give for Viper. These are arguments that you give for give, give for a player like Gumayushi. But this is a point where I need to begin to really cherish, really really cherish Light as a player, right? I think that. Uh, light for his performance in summer. I'm going to assume that moving into the world's meta that a lot of things will carry, carry over. And I think that Light uh, deserves to be a second place because of what I mentioned before. I think that he was ph phenomenal. The main thing, right, why I'm arguing with myself between Elk and Light here, right, is because Elk had one best of five where he looked like a fucking god, and that was against light. That is the main thing, right? <laughs> it's like Elk looked like a god against light. He reminded of reminded us all of how good he is, right? So this is where you are picking and choosing, right? You're picking and choosing here, and it comes down to you know what you prefer. If it's a question, Yamaro, who do you think is going to do better at Worlds? Probably Elk, because I think Elk is paired together with the best support in the world, right? That is on. Light, I think Crisp is a player that is insanely inconsistent. Can be insanely good, can be insanely bad. And of course, a player like Light is going to suffer from that. But I think that I'm going to do this because I want to fight the good fight for Light, because he, he fucking deserves it. I think his summer was completely, completely insane. Completely insane. All right, let's see what some of these names in the AD carry position that we have. So we need to slot in Aiming, we need to slot in Pays, we need to slot in Gumayushi. Um, people might be, you know, I think that T1 as a team has suffered and they are not good. and. I think role agency is an all-time low for AD carry, right? All-time low. But with where I imagine this meta continuing, we mentioned Varus, Kalista, Jin even. I think that... Hmm. This is where it gets tough, guys. I don't want to be too recent, recently, like recency biased when it comes towards Pays. I think that Pays is a very, very solid player and he's had some fantastic games and there were best of fives where he carried two.
it's it's weird because Genji drafted themselves in positions where pays needed to be clutch. I think that's the main thing that you can hold against them, right? I think that Viper and Elk and Gumuyushi perform better in the clutch. They perform better in the driving seat. But these are also players that perform worse in some cases in the back seat. I think the Pays had a pretty poor finals. But you had that best of five before. When he played the Ziggy, you know, and he was doing super well. But I think that's what he's best at. When he has to stabilize both and do less. But looking at the meta of this World Championship, maybe that's what's necessary, right? That's what's important. Another thing I have to keep in mind, I don't rate Lehens that highly. Right? Because I do think that the top side is the driving force of Genji, right? But sometimes you need players like that that are like that, right? Another player that we didn't mention yet is Jackie Love. Jackie Love, I think that his spring split was great. I think that his summer, the beginning of it, was great. But then there was a sharp drop-off. Sharp, sharp drop-off. That makes me wary. Because I think in the worst series that Topis was have ever played, and Jackie Love stands out to me as a player that is a problem. So, let's think about it. Who are we putting forth? I think... I have to put Amy. I... Aiming... Aiming is the reason this team is at the World Championship. Aiming is the reason this team is at the World Championship, and his role has less agency, and I think still he had great games. I think that the reason they are at the World Championship is aiming. And I think that when the meta was in a place where he could carry, he did carry. With the Zeri, with the Kaisers, with the Ezreals. And then now it has shifted into a more of a supportive role, and I think still he plays fucking good. And he has to play with the worst Eastern support at the tournament. The rookie that is Moham. Next in line, I think, for all the arguments I held against Pace, I think this is a meta where, you know, the qualities of Pace are very important. Very important. I think that Pace had a fantastic MSI. And there is a part of me here that is worried that I'm focused too much on the finals. Because I think leading up to the finals, he was really, really good. But I think that as you will go deeper into a tournament, you need someone like... Like, I think that Pays will not have the greatest role in Genji's like, success, right? But then again, I highlighted that AD carry is the role with the least amount of agency, so maybe that's the best thing that you can have, right? So there's a part, as I'm thinking out loud, I understand that there's some contradiction here, you know? I understand that. I think pays on fifth, I think that makes sense to me. It's like, I, I feel like it's always going to be held against him that Pace is playing with Chovy until he doesn't. That's the weird part about Pace, right? It's always going to be held against him until he doesn't and shows that he can grab a series by the neck and, and drive, you know? And really drive. Next for me is uh, Gumiyoshi. Gumiyoshi, we're going to talk about Gumiyoshi. This video is going to fucking take forever if I repeat it. Gumiyoshi, number six. I think the meta is going to look super good for him. I think Gumiyoshi 
is a player that um, is really good in the clutch, right? And um, I am putting Gumayushi 6, right? I think his body of work together with T1 is not the greatest in summer. They were suffering. And um, I think that Gumayushi is still a very dangerous laner. And uh, I think that Gumayushi, when they win, I think he's a big part of why they function. I think that he needs to adjust super hard to how his jungle and super play all the time. And I think that, um, you know, if you look at the legacy of Gumayushi, if you look at uh, the 2023 World Championship, this is what you can say about the whole T1, right? All of T1, I think, individually were the best player in their position at 2023. You know? Number seven. This is where I slot in my boy Jackie Love. I think that Jackie Love has similar qualities to Elk and Viper, but right now, currently, I think that there are some cities that really, really stand, you know, that they are heavy on the shoulders of Jackie Love in terms of how I shape my opinion around them. So I have to put him here seventh. You know, the, the, thing, the thing is, the beauty of this list, right, outside of maybe light and aiming, uh, these are players that definitely in the right conditions can be, like, the best, you know? AD Carry is insanely stacked because number eight is fucking Gala, right? Number eight is Gala. There's no there's no East, Western player that uh, slots in here uh, above these eight players. Um, I, I think that... That this list of AD carries is fucking demonic, bro. This is a crazy fucking list of AD carries. Absolutely tremendous. I think Gala probably had the, the, the weakest year of his career in terms of how, you know, outspoken his gameplay is. I see mistakes from Gala that I have never seen before when uh, I think that he he kind of bought into the LNG suffering, you know? So there's that. Okay. Next in line. Han Sama. What a fucking resurgence, guys. What a fucking resurgence. Uh, I think that he really, really found form. I think that he was an important part uh, of, of course, an important part of G2's success in their playoff run. I think the issue with Han Sama is that his mistakes that he's done are so damn memorable. Very, very memorable. Uh, I think that, I think that his mistakes are insanely memorable, uh, like the LDR or like getting caught on mid that just cost so much. But I think overall, I think that he is really, really good. And I think where the meta is, I think that he falls. He, it's it's going to be good for him, whether it's Ash, MF, Jin, fucking, you know, all these champions, Varus, like he's in his element, you know, he's in his element, you know. Um, he he definitely has um, some, some 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 mistakes that really make you want to put you know scissors in your eyes, but if you look at his you know entirety, I still think he's a really really fucking good player, you know, and I think that he has qualities that allow him to compete in lane, you know, which I think is super important. Together with a player like Mickey, uh, next one here for me is Yeon. I think Yeon is really fucking good. I think that Yeon enables CoJJ to do whatever the fuck he wants. I think that Yeon and CoJJ really fucking good laners. I think they are the biggest, uh, you know, the, the biggest danger of Team Liquid. You know, I think that Yeon and CoJJ uh, being able to like contest and compete and have lane agency allows them to play the swapping game that they love to play. If Yeon and KoJJ can't push, can't contest, this team will fall apart. Because the way they draft and the way they play is so basically around uh, the, 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 the swapping, you know? So I think that um, Yeon is, is my guy here. Yeon is my guy here. And next one in line for me is uh, Masu. So Masu, I do think that his performance at MSI was pathetic. I think that he has rapidly improved, rapidly improved. I think I think that's what's so fun about North America right now is that um, I think both Yeon and Masu 
APA2, I think that they've had some of the best improvements that I've seen in a long time. Um, and that's really fucking wonderful to say. I'm also still gathering experience. I think that in terms of his range of champions to be effective and his improvement together with Busio's improvement is really, really good. So I think that he deserves to be here. He deserves to be here. Only major regions, yeah. We're not going to put in Shogun here or, you know, we're not going to put anything. We're not going to put anything, you know? All right. Who do we have next? So we have... You know, it's like Noah is a weird one, you know, because Noah, you know, I do think that he had a decent finals, decent finals. I, I do think that he's battling some demons. Uh, like, how how much are you going to look past that? How how much are you going to think that that's going to affect him? I, I do think that Noah at his best could uh, be up here, you know, I do think that Noah at his best could be up here, uh, but there's a lot of demons that, that hang over Noah. I do think Noah and June, most of them have a very good lane phase. It's just that when it comes to the Fnatic macro and the Fnatic team fight selection, I do think that, um, you know, it ain't, it ain't there. Now as well, you know, I think, I think that Tomo definitely revived the team, right? Tomo, Tomo definitely like, uh, they revived the team. I don't want to be that guy to say, wow, Tomo is shot calling everything and made everyone play better. Sometimes there are simple things that hold you back from being better. So I, I kind of want to put super above uh, Tomo. Um, I think that uh, 100 Thieves looks a lot better with Tomo. Uh, but but the jump from Meech, I think you know he was underground and Tom was like jumping off ground, and I think that Super genuinely I think he's playing a lot better for Matt than he did in the past. I think that he was important in the wins. I think that uh, he he has played good in the, in the regional playoffs. I think that Super deserves some props for that. I think that Super has actually played, you know. Uh, better and has improved. All right, I think that's it for Eddie Carey. Um, should we should we move on to the one that will shock the world the most? Yeah, let's do it. So I have on. There's only there's only two players you can put one and two. Nobody else, nobody else belongs here. If someone tells me the light should be first. I think that's okay too, right? I have on first because I think that um, in terms of in terms of his creativity. Hello. Hello, I'm busy. You have ten minutes. No, I'm busy. Please, Elena. I want to troll you. No, please close the door. So, on is the type of player that is going to have a range of eighty to one hundred ten percent in his performance. Right? Let's say 100% is a perfect game, right? Maybe, maybe the range is more like this, okay? This is on. The light is a player that plays at a 90 to 95% at all times. Okay? This is, the, then it's just a question of what do you prefer, right? I think that the light is insanely fucking consistent, insanely fucking good, right? I love the fact that on is really really elevates what the support role can do but in the pursuit of that you carry risk so there's going to be moments where on combos in and you're like what the fuck did he just do and if you're a player that or a person that prefers the consistency you put the light first if you prefer the spice of on that comes with a little bit of a kick and a burn you put on first but there's no other players that should be in the conversation up here. Lane phase, team fighting, champion pool cover, you know? I think that you could say that on plays range champions better than the light. I think that's a fair criticism, right? I'll prefer on on 
um, Renata, Lulu, this type of shit, I think that's better for Delight. All right? Delight, Delight wants to play Rakan, Papuchka. Rakan, Papuchka, all that jazz. But the main thing, how I evaluate supports, right, beyond the lane phase and the team fighting, because like engaging with melee supports, a lot of people can do, right? But, but, I think in terms of how they play the map as well, is really, really good. And now for the most controversial pick of the whole list, I have Mickey X third. This is going to drive a lot of people crazy. But the, the main thing that I focus on, right, in terms of elevating the ceiling of your team in the macro department, you are heavily held back by how good your support is. That's why support to me is the role with the second highest agency in the game after mid lane, right? So when you think of these teams that are macro wise lagging behind the top end, think about the issue that they have in the support department, right? I think that Mickey and Caps elevate the macro for G2 to the point where they can compete with the best. Keep in mind, I think the G2 will fall short in the team fights and in the lane phase, right? But macro wise, I think they compete with both Bilibili and Genji. Why is ADC so low agency when ADCs are so strong they're played mid all the time? Well, that's the thing. People are playing carries mid. Tristana, Koki, whatever, Smolder. They're playing carries mid because you don't have movability from mid. All low roads lead to you. So as I have explained Mickey X, right? I think that in terms of lane phase, like you can, for sure, I, I know the fact that Mickey ran it. They died level two a lot of fucking games. I understand that. His regional finals was really, really fucking good. And I think that Mickey is the type of player that really ramps up in preparation for tournaments. Whether it, like, like he has such a long body of work at this point, guys. Mickey is a legendary player. He's probably the, the, the second best player out of Europe, right? Mickey has always ramped it up when it comes to internationals. Look at MSI, look at past World Championship 2019 MSI as well. He had fucking injury of his wrist, right? He has a lot of legacy, right? So I, I believe, I believe, which could be wrong, that he's going to ramp up, right? Ramp up the weaknesses that we see. Poppy, like Mickey was single-handedly sister fisting T1's bot lane with Poppy. Right? And that's something that can get banned, of course. But I'm just highlighting, you know, the Mickey effect. And I really, really believe that supports are the ones that elevate your macro level in terms of information gathering. And I think that you will see, you will see the trend, right? You will see the trend as how I'm ranking the supports. For example, Moham is someone that is memed, right? Moham is someone that is memed. God bless him. He's a he's a rookie. He replaces Kellen. He's under a lot of pressure. God bless his soul. But keep in mind, Damon's macro is ass. It's ass. Complete garbage. They don't know how to progress games. They get leads and then it's it's 40 minute, 50 minute banger. What the hell is happening? But the way support shows on midwave, the support gathers information, allowing your side lanes to push, King and Showmaker getting caught left and right, free food. Supports really have a big fucking role in the current state of the game, in my opinion. My next person here is uh, Mako. The main criticism towards Mako, I do think that he is really good. I think that he's really, really good. I I do think that, um, you know, I think the underperformances of Mako go hand in hand with the underperformance of Jackie Love. 
I think that you can make an argument to put Mako over Mickey, right? I think that's fine to make. But there is the, the series where Top Esports look bad, Mako looks very bad, right? And that stands out to me, right? That really, really stands out to me. I think that when Top Esports play well, they play really, really well. They play around cream. Uh, they, 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 they pressure side super well. Really, really good, you know, uh, coverage of river. And I think that's super, super good. I think that's fantastic. But there are moments, keep in mind he's fourth. We're not putting him in some fucking bum elo, right? You're putting him fourth. The games where Top Esports look worse. And the reason why I am worried about Top Esports and they have a wide range of play falls on Mako too. Falls on Mako too. You can't blame only Jack Love. You can't blame only Cream. And Tian, you can't blame at all because I think he's been the most consistent player of, of the team. Most consistent player of the team. Which is funny to say. Tian has had a great year. <laughs> Tian has been really good this year. So while Meiko, legendary, really fucking good. I think that he has had some rough series that really stain him. You know? And I think that if I, you know... If I keep those in mind, he, I put them forth. I think it's to the point where I would even want to put the hands above them, right? Like the hands of Mako, I think you have to pick your poison here, but I would follow the line of logic that I had before. So the hands, the hands, in my opinion, is a player that has that is kind of. I don't blame him, right? Because Genji had a way of playing the macro game, right? They had a way of playing the macro game where their solo laners were pushing side and Lehen's job was very easy. He was always late together with Canyon at contesting side. But the thing is, it's like Genji macro is similar to T1 macro, but way better. They just have solo laners that have really, really good judgment of what they can and cannot do, right? Lehens involves himself way too little. And I think the biggest gap that we saw between Hawa Life and JNG in the finals was the fact that Popushka, me, Mr. Popushka himself, Peanutty... Oh no. Elena, please. The paprika you bought was bad. Okay, then go to the store. Please leave me alone, I'm, I'm recording something. <laughs> so, Lehens, mechanic is super good. I think this MSI was fucking wonderful. I, I think that he's a strong player, right? But I think in, in terms of being a driving force in the macro, I think that if it wasn't for how good Keen and, and Chovy are at figuring out their own conditions at pushing side, I do think that Lehens would have a bigger spotlight on himself in terms of his flaws. I think that he's a very strong laner. I think that he's a very, very good mechanical player. And I think that his impact on his team macro is why I put him below the other. And fair, fair game. Lehens was fantastic at MSI. Best support at MSI. Beat out my homie on and, and so forth. Right? Fair play. But I think that in a world where I think that support has a very, very high agency, uh, I think that I want to see more from him. So we continue. Number six. Number six. I think we have to... Hmm. This is where it comes... The, the, what comes into question is like how harsh do you judge Crisp? Because Crisp... Crisp and Weibo's losses is, is straight up running it down. But Crisp is straight up just running it down. But when Weibo Gaming play well, it's because their bot lane plays well and thousand plays around them and they 
do well. So Crisp played very bad during the Billy Billy finals, in my opinion. Very bad. He got completely smurfed on. And then the series against LNG, I think he borderline solo lost that shit. But they played finals and then the next day they played against LNG. It's kind of a fucked up proposition. The way Upset framed it to me, he said, yo, if I'm playing finals, my adrenaline is running so fucking high, I don't know how the fuck I'm supposed to sleep and then play the next day and think about the next match. After playing a fucking finals. So I'm like, hmm, that's, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Do I put that into valuation? But Weibo Gaming, I think they live and die by Crisp, crisp and um, Light and by extension Tarzan. And I think that Weibo's run all the way up to the finals needs to be appreciated. But the series against LNG, series against Billy Billy, who series against Billy Billy, he ran it. He ran it the fuck down. How do you evaluate a play like that? It's like, fuck me, right? Now, I really, really, as you can see in terms of my criteria, I really, really have a high, high view of the impact that the support has on the macro aspect of your gameplay. Keria is a player that you can argue is better mechanically than everybody on this list. There's someone in the chat that said, I am too biased because how a life won one single series? No, this has been a criticism I've held against JNG before they even lost. So get out of here with that shit. You're talking, you're talking to someone that has watched every single game. And I am biased, and I'm willing to admit that. But don't tell me that I am saying it because how Life won one single series. That is something that has been true about Genji for the longest time. So I repeat, I think that if, if, if sup the super role is a mechanical test, Lucianami, Renata, Kalista Renata. Um, I think that On and Keria are the supers that you want to have. I think that Keria smokes Delight, Miki, Mako, Lehens even. I think he smokes them all. But I don't think that's the game right now. I don't think that's the game right now. So here in my mind, you know, it's like I, I am I am thinking to myself, it's like, is there a world where I put Korea higher? Korea is the player support, you know? It's like you you want flash shit, you want you want juicy shit, Korea is your guy, you know? But I think Crisp has a very big impact on Weibo Gaming's macro. And and I think this is what Korea doesn't. I think the T1 has lost their sharpness, right? They've lost their sharpness, and it's like, I think, a very, very big difference to T1's qualification here into this World Championship is the, the previous times, they just lost to Genji in a final. They still beat out everybody because they team fought better, and they mechanically, like, performed. And they are lacking that. They're really, really lacking that, right? You know? I feel like doing well at this World Championship is tougher than the previous one. The funny thing is, I thought that coming into 2022, I thought 2022, this is the championship the T1's gonna have, bro. They are so fucking good. 2023, I thought, damn, this is gonna look rough because of the support meta. And then it just changed mid-tournament because they decided to. And I think a lot of things need to fall into place for you to be able to do that. But I round off the career point by saying if T1 do good at this tournament, 
it is going to be because Korea found this element and Zeus found this element. So I highlight that. Next in line for me is uh, Core JJ. I even considered putting Core JJ higher, man. I think I think Core JJ is a very very big reason as to why he the Team Liquid is good. Like people talk about Team Liquid being good, I think that impact is perfect for the way that Team Liquid want to play. If you think about this Chambi pool, these are champions that are always hard to dive, hard to pressure, good in low economy. Mordekaiser, Jax, fucking Kesante. Team Liquid, the way they play, they carry the momentum of their bot lane and to pressure swap on every possible way, which makes the enemy think twice, make them, uh, you know, pressure them throughout. It worked all the way into the finals until FlyQuest, Busio improved and Busio defended dives and also Bwipo no longer hard traded on waves where he didn't have information on Bolle. That was a very clever improvement from FlyQuest, right? And I think that Core JJ contributes a lot in the market department about being on the map first, pressuring onto mid, and I think that um, there's that, you know? There's that. I think that macro-wise, Core JJ is very, very good. I think the knock against Core JJ is that, you know, I think that in, in, in the mechanical department, I, I, I am... Um, a little bit more wary towards him, you know? Uh, and also, I think that the regional resistance, like, before Busio started playing good, right? Busio playing good in the finals, I think the supports in NA were non-existent. Non-existent. Who, who is a good support in North America? Busio improved with the help of Mithi. God bless. Happy to see that shit. But, who, who's the support? Vulcan? Ayla? Ayla? Isles? Oi, oi. Super the suffering, bro. Super the suffering. The funny thing is, I didn't realize that Busio was a roll swap mid laner. I didn't realize he was a roll swap mid laner. I was like, there, there should be more people that roll swap in North America to support. And then, then, oh, Busio actually roll swapped. I was like, okay, that makes sense. Uh, the next homie here, we have Hang. So, Hang has his moments. You know, Hang is the type of guy that impresses the average eye. In the sense that, wow, he just hit a nice combo. Wow, he just hit this crazy Nautilus hook. Wow, look at that Raka. Thing is, LNG is... It's like, when, when you look at a team that is lacking fucking creativity and any fucking urgency in the game to actually play to your odds and to be impactful, like Hang doesn't contribute to that at all. Hang shows up, plays mechanically good, but that's about it. He's a highlight reel type of... highlight reel type of player. And I don't rate him. And that's the reason why I don't rate LNG so high. I think Scout and Zika are fucking good. But the rest of that ensemble, I am not too sold on. Next, 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 next. This is where it gets funky again. We're getting funky. We're going to funky town, guys. We're going to funky town. We're going to funky town. I think we covered all the Eastern ones in Mickey. We're at number nine. Where we're missing, um, we're missing Moham. Fucking Moham. Fucking Moham. Moham is so bad. <laughs> Moham is so bad. I don't want to overrate Busio off of one series, but he did improve a lot. You know, should I put Busio here over Muhammad Ali? Juni, Juni was so good, bro. Juni was so good. Juni was so good MSI in spring, and then this summer, I'm like, what is Juni doing, bro? What is Juni doing, bro? Fuck me, Juni. It's like, should I just abandon June like that, bro? Should I abandon June like that? I don't know if I can, bro. 
June MSI, really good spring split, winter split, good, but then the fall off after the video has been tough. Very tough. Oi, 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 oi. In the spirit of saving time, in the spirit of saving time, oh, we need to think about Alvaro too, bro. You turn off the streams post MSI, I think. Huh? Yeah, Moham, Moham is not coming in here, guys. We are currently thinking about June, Alvaro, and Busio. Like, I, I can do this. Ayla is for sure there. Ayla is for sure there. I think that... I think that Alvaro is, like, important for the team. I think Moham is, like, here. Moham. Um... And then it's like... I don't know, it's like Alvaro is, is pretty solid. Alvaro's pretty solid. But once again, Mad Lion's macro is fucking goofy, man. Fuck me. Are we putting Alvaro here, bro? Are we putting Alvaro here, bro? We're putting fucking Alvaro here, bro. That's, that's the move. That's the move. June Bucio. June. June Bucio. Juni, Juni, Juni Bucio. Anyhow, let's let's throw Bucio the bone, guys. Let's throw Bucio the bone. Let's throw Busio the bone. So, Alvaro is a little bit of an outlier here because I do think that Mad Lion's success, I think that... I think that Alvaro and Elioia is what makes Mad Lions interesting. I think that Busio did insane improvements. I think that the biggest improvement Flacos did was just boost your understanding how to play the map. Like, he, he turned into a different player, bro. Different player. Baba! Lovely. Really good. I think that, that, that boost your flag was really good. But, still, dry feet. Need to see more, man. I love how underrated Humanoid is in general when he usually is better than most mid laners in the world. Yeah, I, I think Humanoid is, is a very interesting one to rate. Like, you can see Humanoid... I can see Humanoid outperforming this, 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 this. Right? But... Will he do it to push you over the line? Will he... Be here sometimes? Yes. That's the issue. That's the issue, bro. You can't sit there and say, maybe he turns it up. We 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 can't we can't say that shit, bro. My man died way against Aurelion Soul 1v1. That is crazy. I don't know, bro. I think I think June was very weak. I think I think June was very, very weak in the in the in the regional in the regional finals. Very weak. All right, let's do top lane, yeah? Bin, without a question. Bin is one of the best players in the world. Bin is god tier, bro. Bin is fucking god tier, bro. Bin is so fucking good. Is Moham that shit? Bro, I've seen Moham do some mental shit. I think it's crazy that Moham even made it to Worlds, bro. Moham is dizzy, bro. Bin is unfair. Bin is Keen and Zeus in one. So the only person in my mind, the only people that can stand up to him and fucking lane and compete, it's like Zeus versus Bin is the biggest firework fireworks ever. 
Because you know these guys are going to lane to the fucking deep end. These two, right? The crazy thing about Ben is that he is a master of so many styles. I think that he plays side lanes super, super well. I think that he is um, super, super good at fight selection. Really, really good range of champions that he can play. Like, he has steadily improved on his weaknesses all the time, bro. Bin is turning 21 soon. Bin is so fucking young. Bin, to me, is a top lane GOAT, right? It's not a part of this conversation, because coming into this tournament is different. But Bin has had one of the most impressive careers, like, in, in the short span of anybody. First year, World Finals with Suning. Fucking players that didn't do shit after that roster. 2021 RNG MSI winner. Gets griefed because RNG want money for every game that Uzi plays. So uh, Bin gets traded back to Billy Billy. On Billy Billy, he is a lethal weapon, carries fucking games. Waits for the arrival of his boys. Um, you have, uh, of course, Billy Billy ramping up, ramping up, competing, uh, you know, contesting. Uh, Bin was always ready for them. Now he has night, final, final, fucking winner, winner. Three, three, three split wins on his belt, one MSI win under his belt, has been up there all the time. Uh, I think Bin is an absolute demon. Um, I think that the only person that can maybe take a win off of him in a lane phase is Zeus, because Zeus is fucking phenomenal as a laner. I'm hoping that we get to see Bin versus Zeus because it was so damn explosive. Did you guys, do you remember when they played off against each other in the best of three? You had one game, Bin got solo killed in the, in the Nara Necton matchup. And then the next game, he was solo killing the shit out of Zeus in the Gragas Jax matchup. You know, fireworks. But I think that Bin is way more complete as a player, right? Next in line for me, with this being said, I think, I think the main... It's once again a question of flavors, right? Because I, I put Keen here. I think the Keen is insanely fucking solid. And I'm hoping that he kind of steps away from the fact. Steps away from the fact that he is too heavily of a role player. Like, why the fuck was he picking Udyr in that finals, bro? Why is he playing Kisanta every game? I just, I'm so pissed at Genji because he didn't change anything about their approach that entire best of five. And this has been the main criticism towards Keen. Like, Keen has always been a really, really fucking good player, right? Even before Genji, he was really fucking insane. But in those best of fives, there was occasionally moments where you're like, what the fuck? Wake up, man. Wake up. You need to carry some games, man. Pick something different. Drop some fucking unique champ here, man. You know? And fair play, I think in terms of how Genji is built, I do think that Canyon and Chovy should be the people that break form when it's necessary. But I think that Keen still is a phenomenal laner, phenomenal fucking side laner, great team fighter. I think that Keen is a very, very good player. Very good player. And I think he deserves two based on the consistency and body of work throughout this year. Okay. Third. <laughs> Third. Is Zeus. Why? I think that he has a very, very wide range, insane laner. I think the difficulty of Zeus is that it's weird because the, the career of Zeus and the Shy, it's like people like to mean, but there's some narratives that are like so true, you know? There's some narratives that are very true. I think Zeus often doesn't get good jungle attention, doesn't get good support attention, and he dies on sight, you know? 
But him dying on side, I can't blame only him for that. And maybe I'm being too generous to him. But I feel like when Zeus had gold, when Zeus has counter pick, I think he carried games. You think that if we load into the lobby and he drops, let's say, a Yon answer into an Aatrox, are you going to doubt Zeus? You're not going to. So I think that Zeus is really, really good. I think the main things that stand out for him, of course, is the lane phase and the team fighting. And the main thing that he is lacking, right, is in the macro department, right? That's where I think Keen and Bin beat him out. The next person in line for me here is 369. Fucking hell, he's numbers. So he fucking gets pushed to the right. I do think that 369 year, his year, has been not super, super exciting, not super, super interesting. But I think he's been solid throughout. I think that coming into a tournament like this, we have to think about his pedigree as a player. And I do think that 369 is not the type of player to pull his team to the other side when Kareem and Jackie Love are underperforming, which is a very, very fine structure to have. While I say that this is probably one of the weaker years of 369, that's not an insult because his last years have been amazing. He still carries games on the likes of Renekton, is a beast of a fucking Kesante, and I think that 369 is the type of player that is going to suffer from the inconsistencies of his teams. I'm giving Zeus a pass, I'm giving 369 a pass too. Uh, fifth for me is Zika. I already highlighted why I think LNG functions, and I think it's because of Zika and Scout. I think that Zika was the person who started the ramp up and also was willing to pick some unique champion choices to be a bit of an outlier um, for his team. I think that Zika has had a good run. I think that he started the trend of LNG doing better. And I think past this point, the drop-off is real. <laughs> past this point, the drop-off is very real. <laughs> I think past this point, the drop-off is very real. <laughs> Trying to think if there's somebody I'm missing. Because who do we need to think about? We have Kingen. We have Breathe. We have BB. We have Impact. We have Doran. So, Breathe is a player that is very inconsistent. I think he has a very wide range of play. I think that he, like, the, the way I think about Breathe is, is like, Breathe is like, I think he does good into players that are worse than him, but I think that he doesn't know how to lose gracefully at all. I think that Breathe is the last guy you want to send in to Zeus and Bin because they're going to ham fist him, you know? Really, really ham fist him. Um, Doran as a player, like he's such a fucking goofball, man. Such a fucking goofball. Like it's a testament to how alive that they beat Genji when Doran played the way he did. Like his fucking Camille game was absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. Kingen, I think Kingen had a good split, but his regional and playoff play, really, really. Like, the moment they disabled Aurora, I think Kingen just, it's, he just lost his mind. I, he never, never, I never found me, I never found love in Kingen's gameplay, even though I defended him and thought that he should be in top three uh, after the regular split for Damon. Now the question is, are we willing to put Western players above the Eastern players? I don't know if I'm ready to do so. I feel like the challenge of, of surviving and playing top lane in Korea and in China is far more difficult. What the fuck is top lane and in Europe and in... in what is top lane in Europe and in NA right now?
Because like regional resistance really, really comes into play here for me. Regional resistance really, really comes into play here. I think that BB and Impact are very commendable players. I think that uh, they have a lot of experience, so they know how to like survive and they know how to be impactful. But are they going to be better than Doran? I don't think so. The thing is, it's like always when we see these players that we like to meme on regionally, when we see them against Western players, they look fucking good. They look fucking good. It's like a different game altogether. So I, I don't want to jump the ship here too fast. I do agree that BB and Impact can hold their own, right? But are they better? It's a different conversation to say that they are better. Okay. Is Doran just next in line? It's like we have Doran, Breathe, King. This this has to be it, right? Honestly, Kingen is the type of player that I could drop, but I, I think this needs to be the list. I feel like, you know, the, the, the beauty of Doran, right? Because I've thought, I pondered over this so much. I pondered over this so much. I was like, why the fuck is Doran on these teams? I, I feel like his output is very consistent. He can eat a bag of shit and he will still smile. You get me? So that's that's where I'm at with 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 Doran and why I'm putting him six. Now the question is, can we push King and down? I don't know if we can. Like I I don't see a world where like. Like, Kingen is going to be giga outperformed. I don't think Kingen is great. I don't think Kingen is good. But will Kingen get outperformed? I, I don't think so. I don't, just don't think so. I got BB here and then I got Impact here. That's, that's where I'm at. Look, I think I think Impact is a fantastic, fantastic player to have if you are playing exactly the way Team Liquid would like to play, right? But that way relies on bot lane being stronger. When their bot lane is weaker, you begin to see the the flaws. Because if you think about the champions that Impact likes to play, these are like great 1v2 champs, great fucking champs that are strong in dive. And the, big, the highlight reels of Impact, if you look at the split, right? The MVP Impact is him fucking killing 1v2. Him like, uh, you know, really, really uh, setting up the wave in a way to set up his team for the swap. You know, this is, this is the mastery of Impact. Impact is a very, very intelligent player. But when it comes to being in isolated 1v1s and so forth and having depth in his champion pool, this is where I, I think less of impact. Right? Who is next? Fuck no. 
How the fuck do we raid these players? So we have Whippo, Oscarinin, Sniper, and Midwin. <laughs> it's like Whippo is really good. I think that his the, the issue with Whippo, right, is that one in four games he's gonna solo lose. That that's that's a crazy fucking that's a crazy fucking thing to have on your head. <laughs> but, but one in four games, Whippo's gonna solo lose. Like. That's a, that's a, that's like a proven concept, bro. You look at the Flag Quest series, bro. You look at the Flag Quest series and that Urgot game is, was mental. There was like one game in the other series, I don't remember, it was like a C9 where he plays Renekton and he just TPs and walks into the enemy team. But when he plays well, he plays really fucking well, man. When he plays well, he team fights well. Like when, when he plays well, he team fights well. It is what it is, you know. And there's that, man. I think next in line is also a question of flavors. It's like I like Oscarinin. I like Oscarini when he plays Poppy and Kisante. But how he translates his leads and how he impacts the game post a certain point is so mute. So for me here, I I have to put, put I have to put Mirwin. I I, I think that Mirwin has shown range and shown the capacity to like carry games while i think oscarin is good mechanically and i think that he has some standout champions it's hard for me to rate him higher with the flaws that i believe that oscarin have but if someone tells me oscarin should be here should be here I, maybe on a different day i'll agree with you you know it's like oscarin it's like i got hope for oscarin when I watched MSI, I was like, damn, he plays Camille? Ooh, that's that's a solid game. But he didn't push it over the line, you know? And I think that the first 15 minutes of the game, I think Oscar Irin is really solid. But then... That's yeah, rough. All right, number 14. Number 14. Sniper. Just a rookie boy, guys. Rookie boy. Rookie boy. Okay. Food is ready, take while warm. I am gonna just finish jungle. So jungle, I think there's only three players you can have in your top three. The ordering of them, I think, is depending on your flavor, right? I think without a doubt, Peanut had the most impressive performance out of any jungle performance, right? Most impressive performance of a jungler was Peanut. All the way through summer split, all the way into playoffs, I think that Peanut played better than Canyon, right? Peanut played better than Canyon. Now the question is, in terms of looking at legacy and what kind of a player Canyon is, I think this is where Canyon has way more to say, right? So the main knock against Peanut is that his teams fizzle out as tournaments progress. Right? And that's also an argument against Tarzan. So now the question is, do you care more about the pedigree of the past and what you expect the player to represent at the World Championship, or do you care more about the, the recent performance? Right? In my mind, I 
value canyon and i do think that the argument against me here is say yamaro canyon had a very uninteresting split very uninteresting split he had very low first blood percentage um i think that you know very low first blood percentage uh, he was very inactive in games, lost steam after the AP carries, carry, carry nerfs. And I would say I agree with all of this. I do. I think Tarzan and Peanut had better summer splits than Canyon. Okay? But you have to look at it through the lens of we are Battle rating Genji as one of the best teams of this World Championship. Right? It's like they've had a fantastic body of work. Fantastic body of work. And I think the majority of that, in my mind, is on Keen and Chovy. I think MSI run, playoff run, I think Canyon Chovy, absolute beasts, right? Absolute beasts. And I think once again here, Canyon coming into this world championship, I do think that he will step up big time. Like through the lens of what how I see Genji is that I think Canyon and Chovy are the people that need that, that are going to step up for this team. I believe Genji is good, so I need to be able to say why I think Genji is good, right? I think people are confusing Quid and Quad. Are people confusing Quid and Quad? Because Quad is in FlyQuest, Quid is in a hundred thieves. Do you think Quid is better than APA? And better than Quad? I have a bridge to sell you in Brooklyn. Okay, he's just crazy. He didn't confuse him. He's just crazy. All right. But you, you, you're fair game. You, you're allowed to have that. Uh, you're allowed to have that opinion. Right? Okay. So, once again, I repeat. I think that Canyon, the, 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 the crucial moments that stand out to me as a player, what makes him so unique. I think that even in the finals, I think there were moments where Canyon fucking clutched up, right? He fucking clutched up. Uh, I think that in the final against Hawaii Life when they lost, I think he clutched up with a fucking scanner and did fucking good shit, right? I think the Canyon, his Kha'Zix lock-in against Zinzao will forever fucking be a memory of mine. His fucking Kane games when he steps to the play, I think Canyon carries a legacy into this fucking championship that means so fucking much to me. And these are the type of fucking tournaments that will... You know, there's going to be people to say that Peanut is a jungle goat, and there's going to be people to say that Canyon is a jungle goat. Peanut has a longer fucking career, way, a very, very good level of consistency throughout. Has covered the span of many, many metas, has won so much, right? Has won so much on different teams, which is super fucking cool, right? Canyon is at the highest peak. Canyon is at the highest peak of any jungle. Right? But okay, we put Peanut second. Put Peanut second, and then Tarzan third. Tarzan, I think that Tarzan is like an in-between of Canyon and Peanut. I think that Tarzan was a very big reason why Weibo Gaming fucking got second place in the LPO summer. I think that Tarzan is really fucking good. I think that he slowed down a little bit when he couldn't play carries, but I think that's because of the fabric of the fucking team rather than anything else, right? I think that Tarzan is really, really fucking good, covers many, many fucking metas, and I think that Peanut, Peanut is the fucking tank specialist, right? He's a tank specialist. I think that when it comes to playing Seju, Poppy, all this good stuff, he's fucking good. Canyon and Tarzan can play that too, but he can also play the carry champs better than Peanut, right? If we go into fucking worlds and the meta is Viego, Wukong, Wukong Peanuts is good. If the meta is fucking Viego and like fucking champions that require mechanical expression, I, I get scared shitless. Did you guys remember fucking Peanut playing Viego against fucking Piochik? And he ate shit, right? But I put Tarzan here. I think that he's the reason why fucking Weibo Gaming is that fucking good, right? Tarzan here next. Maybe people are going to put Wei, but I'm going to put Tian here. I think Tian... Same way for top esports, I think that he's been damn fucking consistent. He's been fucking great this year. Tian has been so fucking good this year, and I think that he deserves fucking props for it. I like people are gonna tell me Wei should be here, Wei should fucking come through here, but I think that Wei's job is very simple and streamlined on the team that is Billy Billy. 
And there is no fault in that. But he covers for his lanes, plays very simple champions, locks in the Maokai, takes it easy, right? You know, people are talking about fucking choking, whatever the fuck, but you know, you can fucking, like, if, if that's what you're fucking looking at, then why didn't you guys bring it up when we talked about these fucking three, you know? Peanut, I think that he sometimes when he's pushed and he needs to go deeper, I think that um, that's where Peanut gets challenged. When he needs to, when he needs to be the one to adapt mid series, you don't want to be there. You want him to lock the same type of champion over and over again. If he needs to adapt, he's like, guys, fucking Viego is broken. We need to pick it away. Oh shit, I will do it. And then he will, he will think that it's 2016 and he's Rock Tigers, but he's not. You know. Tian has had a fucking good year, guys. Tian has had a good fucking year. People talk about Tian choking, but bro, look, like even this year at the International, Tian versus Canyon, that five game series was a fucking banger, Tian versus Canyon. Tian was playing fucking good. And then Tian plays against G2 and his bot lane dies. Bot lane dies. His bot lane dies before he completes his clear. And then it's like, ha ha, Yamato, Tian is choking. It's like, bro, it's actually Jackie Love and Mako shitting the fucking bed. Let's fucking call it for what it is, bro. Tian fucking did three camps before his bot lane got double killed. And Tian was fucking good at DWC too, bro. I think Tian deserves to be four. Definitely. Now this is where it gets fucking interesting. Now it gets interesting. I think Wei, I think I think plain and simple, you know, I, I do think that Wei's job is quite chill. I think he's quite chill on his team. I think that he, but he does that job great. He does that fucking job great. So, fair play. Sometimes the opportunities that you have don't allow you to express yourself at the level that you'd want and that's okay way does his job super well but his job is simple and sometimes there's beauty in that but it's kind of you know imagine you are doing a presentation at work you know you have five people you have five people doing presentation at work and then someone tells you yo we need you to format it and add pictures, right? You have to format it and add pictures and you need to fucking pick out some great pictures. And Wei just makes the presentation look fucking beautiful. But the content of it all, like whatever you're reading and the research and all that jazz, is done by everybody else. Do you blame the person for doing the job that he is doing at a, at a great level, do you blame him for not doing more? No, that's just his, you know, that's just his job, right? So, way very honorable in what he does, but I think his job is very streamlined, you know? We're not gonna go into a series at MSI and be like, yo, Wei needs to really step it up here. He needs to fucking pick the champion that's gonna break them. And then Ben just looks at him, he's like, what the fuck? He needs to fucking box him. I'm kidding, of course. All right. All right, next in line, holy. So we need to think about who is left in the East. So we have Lucid in the sky with diamonds. We have Lucid, owner, right? Lucid, owner. Owner is basically jungle career. Mechanical clutch demon, right? Bro, if, if these three criteria were the only criteria that we judge players by, Bro, T1 would be fucking amazing, you know? If it was only these three criteria, right? But there's more to it, right? There's more to it. I think this is this is the main one where T1 lose points, you know? I've I've made this point on multiple podcasts where I would love to see owner together with Delight and Korea together with Peanuts. Because I think they are too similar as profiles, you know? You need someone to fucking pull the other person to do the right thing on the map. 
I think Weiwei is not good. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I think Weiwei is trash. I think, I think Weiwei is not good. I, I, I think Weiwei is fucking horrible. Not horrible, but bad for being an Eastern jungler. Okay, so the next names that need to come up is I'm gonna hold my tongue on the on, on one of the names that I'm gonna say for excitement purposes and excitement build-up. So we have uh I don't know. I I I, I kind of think that I need to put owner here. I have to put owner here. I think that he dropped off hard in playoffs. I, I he dropped off hard in playoffs and became a weak performer, right? But I know this tournament doesn't matter, but I, I do think that a big part of summer, I think that he was really good. I think that EWC is fucking ass of a tournament, but he was fucking good there. Uh, like just as an individual performance, I don't care about the title, but just looking at what he did as a player, he, he was very, very good. I think that owner's legacy also does work here, right? It's like owner at this point is a very fucking experienced player. Very fucking experienced. People are mentioning Lucid, but Lucid is in his first year, guys. He's in his fucking first year. If Lucid is very, very up and down, why would that not continue at the World Championship? My next name here is Inspired. My next name is Inspired. I think that he... Like, I was skeptical at first because I thought that the way he jungled is like giga, giga fucking streamlined. But I think he showed that he is capable of breaking patterns and doing the dirty work too. I think that Inspired is one of the best Western players as a tournament, plain and simple. Someone in the chat wrote, I can't imagine Lucid winning a BO5 against Owner. Well, he did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> he did. The cool thing about Inspired is that, you know, it, it becomes a question of regional resistance and team. It's like it gets to the point, I, I think Inspired is good enough that I don't think he'll ever be an issue in the jungle. But jungle is such a role where it's like the amount of decisions you need to make are far less than a laner needs to do, right? It's like you see mid gaps, top gaps, bot gaps way more clearly because you're doing all these fucking micro decisions in terms of positioning, all your clicks and so forth. But in jungle, it's very streamlined, right? But I think Insp Inspire is going to fucking hold his own against any of these fucking players, you know? I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about it. And now, well, who is next? So we have, I, th I think Lucid comes in next for me. Lucid comes in next. I think he had a very slow spring. Spring playoffs fucking did much better. Found his form. I think that he improved heavily. And then I think uh, when it comes to summer, I think that he had a lot of good games. They took a game of Genji. I think he played phenomenal there. I think this is this is just a rookie finding his footing, you know? Inconsistent as a player, but I think that he actually, you know, has potential. Is he going to fulfill that potential at this World Championship? Probably not, you know? Probably not. But I think that he is a solid enough name that he should be put up above the rest of the guys, right? Because names that come to mind, that, like Razork, Razork is very inconsistent, you know? That is the, the nature of Fnatic as a roster. It seems like when Razork sees the writing on the wall in regards to how his teammates are operating, it seems like Razork is trying to do a lot more in the game. And that's where he looks fucking goofy. So I have some sympathy in terms of how the team functions but but you know 
we have to call a spade a spade, you know? Razok has very, very high highs and is very dynamic in his play. But I, I can't put him above any of these junglers here. I put Razor King. Next in line, I put Weiwei. Next in line, it's like... Now we have the Yikes and the Umtis and the, and the Rivers and the Lioyas. So, River, decent playoffs, terrible year. Good playoffs, terrible year. Right? River. So, I can't put that into account. By my rationale of Alvaro, I also have that same rationale surrounding Elioia. Right? The next person in line here, it's like... I think that Umti at least... Umti at least... has a very clear role for the team, right? I think the Umti is like baby peanut, right? Baby peanut with a shitty smile, right? Well, see, he's fucking the... the he's basically baby peanut. He's, he's the worst version of Peanut. So that's Umti. We continue. I think... I'm gonna put the river last. I don't know, there's, there's, there's some things that are hard for me to shake. It's 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 hard for me to shake about Yike. Elioia had a terrible summer split. But I I do think it's like Mad Lions BG2, and I'm trying to think back to why, right? And for me it was Alvaro, Elioia, and Mirwin. Umti of the Ike is criminal. Umti has been the worst TL player by far. Who is the worst G2 player by far, you think? The, 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 the thing is, it's like, I think that the Ike can be and should be a way better player than Umti. But currently, is he? I don't think so. I think that at least Umti, for me, for me, Umti has a very, very clear, defined role. He picks the tanks. And I know where we have him. And that's it. But Yaik should be a better player. He should be. I think Yaik should be a better player than Umti. Should be way better. But currently I can't say that he is, because at least I can place Umti on something, right? He's a tank player, and that's his role on the team. I feel like with Yaik, it was very, very unclear what the role of the team was, right? Even when we played those brand games, they were silly. Never got to see him play Lilia. He looked awkward when he played some of the tanks, right? But I have to say, Yaik does perform well at the internationals, besides the occasional Belvet lock-in, right? So, that is where Umti, you know, like... Would we think different of him if he smoked? Maybe we would, right? Okay. So now we are here. All right, now we are here, guys. We It's time to make the top 30 list, all right? So keep in mind my role agency. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with everything where it landed. Maybe once again, I repeat, maybe I will do some changes after I sleep on it, something like this, you know, maybe I move Faker up. Um, maybe I uh, move, um, you know, owner down. Uh, maybe I move Keria up because I wake up and I think that mechanics are super, super important, you know? 
Uh, like I could, I, even now I could see a world where I put Kirio over Crisp. You know, I could definitely see that, right? But I'm going to just leave it as it is. You know, people are going to be angry. People are going to be angry. You know, it is what it is. All right. Number one player in the world, Chubby. Number two player in the world, Ben. Number three player in the world. Viper. Number four player in the world, Knight. Number five. Zeka. We got all the fucking crazy mid laners out of the way and the fucking superstars in these rules. Alright. Next one. On. Haha. <laughs> On is my guy. The follow up. I think it's the light. I think the follow up is the light. Here. Hmm. I think the follow-up for me... I'm gonna put Canyon. And then I think it's just fair to put Inati right behind the guy. And then it's just fucking... Just to mix it up a little bit, you know, we can't have the same roll over and over again, you know? We can't have the same roll over and over again. You know, like I can maybe move Viper down, honestly, because of what I talked about, role agency, you know? So let's just fucking put Knight here, Zeka here, and then we put Viper here. There we go. I, I think that's fair. It's just role agency type shit. If, if AD carry was the most important role, then it would look different, you know? All right, so we have Pinari, Canyon, Pinari, and then who do we throw in here? Maybe a little Keen, a little Keen action. A little Keen into Tarzan. We just fucking put Tarzan here, bro, and then a little Keen. Put a little Charlie Keen in there. A little Charlie Keen. And we make it maybe throw in a little light. Throw in a little light. And then I think, uh, honestly, Honestly, let's fucking put fucking another mid lane in there, guys. Let's put another fucking mid laner in there. And then we put fucking light on 13, bro. Put caps on 12, bro. Put caps on 12. I'm a big mid lane enjoyer, guys. Big mid lane enjoyer. If you guys want to hear my fucking reasoning for all these fucking players, you know, then, um, you know, to, to, to scroll back, you know, scroll back. All right. Where do we go to next, guys? I think we just drop a little Elkovic here. We just drop a little fucking Elkovic here. We have our, our third. This is already cleared. This is already cleared. This is already cleared. And then I think we just fucking drop a little Zeus here, guys. A little fucking Zeus. And follow that up with a Mickey S. Mickey X at 16. Lucky number 16, guys. Mickey X number 16. I am probably going to be alone in that, but that's okay. Stick to my guns, guys. Sticking to my guns. So now we have this covered, this covered, this covered, this covered too. And we need to follow that up with somebody. 369 Tian aiming Mako. Hmm. Hmm. I think, I think we just fucking slot Scout in there, guys. We put Scout at 17. I think uh, that's a solid one in my opinion. And then if I look at all of these players, I think that the pedigree of 369 really stands out to me here, man. I'm gonna put a little dash next to his name so it doesn't jump. Uh, we followed that up with an aiming. I think aiming has been really fucking good this year. And then we followed that up with, let's say, um, so I can throw Tian in there. I want to follow this up with Pays. Pays. Pays is a guy. He's a homie. And then we fucking throw in Mako as well. Maybe we put Mako above. We put Mako here. 
make it here. All right. Where do we go from here, guys? I think we throw in the hands next to his boy. It's fitting, but it looks like we are doing it based off of a pattern. And we continue on to a little... I guess at this point, do we just fucking slam... Do we just follow this up with cream? A little fucking cream? Hmm... Hmm. Cream Gumayoshi. Cream Gumayoshi. Cream Gumayoshi. Cream Gumayoshi. Wait. What do you mean, pour the light? The light is here. It's number seven, bro. We have way. Gumiushi, way. Then. Let's throw in a little owner. Crisp. Inspired. Here. There we go. There we go. Boy, where's Zika? We should put Zika somewhere. I think Zika moves to here, guys. Zika moves to here. There we go. Zika, way owner. There we go. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Twenty six. Who do who do I who did I delete now, guys? I fucking lost my track of who I deleted. Gumayushi. Gumayushi. Honestly, I do feel like hmm, these two. I'm this this is the main thing that I am not sure about. If I think about my list, these two. Alright, Gumayushi. Oh. And I was like, should I switch these two, bro? And I was like, bro, I'm putting them over Jackie Love. There we go. There we go. Fuck the super conversation, bro. Mickey is way too high, my friend. This is my list, not your list. This is my list. Not your list. You can make your own list and share it with friends and family. All right. And there we go. There we go, guys. 